Hi, I'm Adam. This is the Machine Tech video blog, and today I'd like to talk to you a little bit about hydrodynamic bearings. As I've mentioned before, there are two main categories of bearing, anti-friction and hydrodynamic. Anti-friction bearings, which are composed of balls or rollers sandwiched between two rings, are often the preferred method of shaft support in modern machinery. They come in many different standardized sizes and styles, and so it's easy to find off-the-shelf replacements for most applications. But where large, heavy machinery is concerned, the hydrodynamic bearing is the bearing of choice. Sure, they're a little less efficient and they have sensitive lubricant needs, but their design is simple, they can handle extremely high loads, and theoretically, they can last forever. A hydrodynamic bearing is really nothing more than a sleeve with some lube in it that a shaft spins around in. But like all simple things, the devil's in the details, and there are various key factors to consider for each one of these components. The rotating component of the bearing is called the journal. The journal is the part of the shaft which actually rides inside the bearing. Since the whole purpose of a shaft is to transmit power in a machine, it's always made out of a strong material like alloy steel or stainless steel. And sometimes the journal sections of the shaft get an additional extra treatment, like chroming, in order to improve its hardness and wear resistance. The stationary component of the bearing can either be an integral part of the machine casing, or it can be a pillow block, which means that it comes as a separately mounted unit with its own base. Now, sometimes you'll find these solid housings, but more often than not, the housings will be split axially, so they can be pulled apart for maintenance. Notice, by the way, the oil groove in the top half, which helps to distribute lubricant throughout the bearing. Now, the inner bearing surface is called a shell, or sleeve, and it's usually constructed in two or three different layers. The first layer is always some kind of strong support material. In this case, it's cast iron, because that's what the housing is made of. Sometimes, there's an intermediate backing layer on top of the support material. And the final layer is a lining of soft bearing material, like copper alloy and aluminum alloy, or most commonly, babbit. Babbit is a type of white metal, which usually includes some percentage of lead, tin, antimony, and copper. Babbit is such a common bearing material that sometimes hydrodynamic bearings are referred to simply as babbit bearings. But why is the bearing shell made of a softer material than the journal? Well, it's a sacrificial component meant to protect the shaft. If there's ever metal-to-metal -metal contact between the sliding surfaces in the bearing, then the bearing shell will wear before the shaft, and then it can just be renewed or replaced whenever necessary. It's always cheaper to reline the bearing than it is to replace the shaft. And another way that the soft bearing material protects the shaft is by allowing foreign debris or contaminants in the lubricant to embed themselves in the bearing shell instead of scoring the shaft. Despite the relative simplicity of their construction, the physics at play in hydrodynamic bearings require some explanation. Let's start with the machine off. The bearing is designed with a carefully sized clearance, or gap, between the journal and the sleeve. It won't be much, maybe only the size of a human hair. The clearance in this animation is exaggerated for demonstration purposes. The clearance is filled with lubricant, usually oil or grease, which is just oil thickened with some type of soap to keep it from running out all over the place. The weight of the shaft and other rotating components causes the journal to sit at the bottom of the clearance, and there's metal-to-metal -metal contact. Notice that this means that the clearance is asymmetrical. It's not the same size all the way around the bearing. This will be important when we turn the machine on, but before we do that, in order to understand what happens during operation, we should talk about the third component of a hydrodynamic bearing, the lubricant. Any fluid, including this molasses, is made up of many tiny little molecules held together by intermolecular forces of attraction. 
When a fluid flows, layers of these molecules slide past one another, attracting and pulling on each other. And this causes resistance to flow. It's like the fluid's internal friction. Most people just think of it as how thick the fluid is, but the technical term for this characteristic is viscosity. Molasses, as well as being extremely delicious, also has a relatively high viscosity. Kerosene, on the other hand, as well as being not delicious at all, has weaker intermolecular forces of attraction and therefore has a relatively low viscosity. But temperature also plays a role in a fluid's viscosity in any given application. When it comes to liquids, an increase in temperature results in a decrease in viscosity, and vice versa. That's where the phrase, slow as molasses in January, comes from. The reason why we care about viscosity in a hydrodynamic bearing is because the same forces which attract fluids to themselves also make them sticky. They're attracted to the surfaces of objects, like the shell and journal in a bearing. When the machine is turned on, the journal begins to rotate. It drags the lubricant around the bearing and jams the lubricant between the two sliding surfaces at the point where they contact. The journal is essentially pumping the lubricant. The pressure underneath the journal begins to rise, and when the journal is spinning fast enough, a lubricant wedge forms which lifts the journal off the sleeve and completely separates the two surfaces. This is where lubricant viscosity plays a crucial role. Too low of a viscosity and the wedge won't form at all, but too high of a viscosity and friction will quickly overheat the bearing. Incidentally, the lubricant wedge also pushes the journal off to one side of the sleeve. This condition is known as full film lubrication. It's like hydroplaning in your car when you drive over a puddle and momentarily lose steering control because the tires are sliding on a film of water. Loads imposed on the bearing are supported in the load zone, and the relatively wide area of the load zone explains why hydrodynamic bearings have such a high radial load carrying capacity. The thickness of the film may only be a thousandth of an inch, but if the bearing was designed with the correct clearance, shaft speed, and lubricant viscosity, and if it's been maintained properly, then there should technically be no physical contact between the two sliding surfaces, and therefore there should be no wear of the journal or the sleeve. Theoretically, a hydrodynamic bearing should be able to run forever without ever needing to be repaired or replaced. In fact, there are some which have been in service for over a hundred years. There are a few variations on the plain hydrodynamic bearing which we've outlined here. For example, since the shaft needs to get up to speed for full film lubrication to form, the bearing is especially vulnerable to wear at both startup and shut down. So the bearings in some very large, very heavy machines have auxiliary hydraulic pumps which actually pressurize the lubricant through oil slots in the bottom of the bearing. This helps to lift the journal off the sleeve. Sometimes these designs are referred to as hydrostatic rather than hydrodynamic. Some bearings are designed with tilting pads equally spaced around the inside of the bearing. The pads can pivot slightly and each one forms its own hydrodynamic wedge. This helps to stabilize the shaft. Now, normally hydrodynamic bearings can only handle radial loads and are free to float axially. But when the tilting pad design is applied to the face of a bearing and mated to a collar on the shaft, then axial or thrust loads can also be supported. Very effectively, I might add. And of course, oil and grease are not the only fluids used in hydrodynamic bearings. The high-speed spindles and the hard drive from your computer actually ride on air bearings with very fine surface finishes. Well, that's your introduction to hydrodynamic bearings, their construction, the basic operation, and a few of the variations. And that's it for today from the Machine Tech video blog. I hope you learned something.